I'm going to speak to you a little on a little something different today. How many of you know what today is? Today is Pentecost Sunday. Fifty days after the Passover was the Feast of Pentecost. All around the world today, in Pentecostal pulpits, ministers will be preaching from Acts the second chapter or Acts the first chapter and then building their message thereon. But I've come by to tell you today there is a global warming alert. There's a global warming alert. Over the past several years, we've heard all kinds of discussion and debate about this thing called global warming. Global warming is defined as an increase in the Earth's temperature or the temperature of the Earth's atmosphere. And it's said to be caused by either human industry or agriculture or by some natural causes that have occurred in the Earth throughout the history of the Earth. We've heard things that cause global warming and we, we become very familiar with terms like uh, greenhouse effect. Have you heard greenhouse effect? Well, a greenhouse effect is explained as being caused by gases that are retained from the sunlight. And scientists tell us that without those gases from the sunlight being retained, the temperature of the earth would be so cold that we would not be able to have life. We would never be able to live life as we know it now. The global warming debate is centered and focused upon whether added greenhouse gases released by human activity will overheat the earth and will cause some harmful effects. And then we've, we've heard terms connected to global warming like carbon dioxide. Ever since the 1700s and in the introduction of uh, uh, the beginning of the industrialized world, these many companies have been emitting gases into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is generally colorless, odorless, non-toxic, and non-combustible gas. Scientists tell us that all of the data that they use to support this theory is gathered from equipment installed on the satellites. On the planet up there are gathering data that scientists have used. And the debate goes on and it goes on and it goes on. There are those, however, who will tell you with absolute certainty and conviction that the global warming theory cannot and will not be proved. The fact is, we've just come through the hardest, coldest, I'm talking globally, the hardest and coldest winter that we've seen on this planet in over a hundred years. So, I said that to say that in this cold winter, there have been all kinds of storms in unexpected places. There have been disasters and people use that to support their theory of global warming. But where is it when we have such a cold winter? Well, I tell you today, that there was a global warming that took place long before Al Gore. Long before Al Gore started the theory of global warming and built all of this interest and confusion over this thing, there was a great, great global warming. Let me take you back to Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How many of you believe that? Amen. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How many of you know that God would not create junk? God would not create chaos. Amen? He would not create something that is useless. Do you agree? Well, let me tell you something that happened. We'll go to the book of Isaiah. And I'll tell you what happened in the realms of heaven. There was an angel named Lucifer, who was the hovering cherub over the throne of God. It was Lucifer's job to lead all of heaven in praise and worship. It was his job to lead all the created heavenly beings in worship of God. And he hovered over the very throne of God. Created in him was all musical ability. In him was all musical ability. Now, I'll just tell you something about music. There are only three kinds of instruments. Stringed instruments, percussion instruments, and vocal. You understand me? Okay, so Lucifer had all this stuff. And while he's, he could have the whole orchestra going at the same time because he had all the strings, he had all of the, 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 the wind, he had all of the, the voice, everything he could create was in him to produce worship at the throne of God. But something happened to him. Something drastically happened to Lucifer. I shouldn't say happened to him because angels have no gender. But something happened to Lucifer. And as he was leading in worship, he got taken up into this thing of all the heavenly creatures looking at him. Looking at him. Focusing on him leading worship to God. And then he decided in his own mind, in Isaiah 14, 13 and 14, God is speaking to Lucifer. God speaks directly to Lucifer and said, you said to yourself. How many of you know God knows what you even say to yourself? You don't have to speak it out loud. He knows our thought patterns. And he said, you said to yourself, I will ascend to the heavens. I will set my throne above the stars of God. Now the stars of God, he was not talking about the stars we see at night. He was talking about the angelic beings in heaven. I will set my, my throne, my throne. I will set my throne above all of the angelic beings. I will sit on the mount of the Lord's or God's assembly in the remotest parts of the north. That's where he said that he would set his throne. And then he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And the last thing that he said and most critical was I will make myself like the most high. Lucifer said I six times and it cost him his position in heaven and he was turned into a devil. I'd be careful how many times I say I. How were you? He said I six times and was turned into a devil, cast down. But in the New Testament we read that his tail drew one third of the angels of heaven. And they were cast out of heaven as well, put in chains into everlasting darkness. And God said he did that as an example to all other created beings. Don't try to usurp yourself in authority and power above God Almighty. 
because you will never able to do it. No angel or earthly creature can ever set himself higher than Almighty God. Can I get an amen in this house? Now let me show you some things that happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1 and 2. It's called the gap theory. Because during that time, Satan or Lucifer was cast down. He became Satan. And all of the angels that followed him were cast out of heaven as well. And the whole created earth that God made in Genesis 1-1 was made to collapse. And God Almighty and Almighty God, I want you to notice the difference there. God calls Himself Almighty God. And in many sections of Scripture, you will find where He referred to His Son, Jesus Christ, as Mighty God. Almighty God is higher than mighty God. And then they looked and saw the chaos of the condition of the world. And Genesis 1, 2 said, God has made the heavens and the earth, and there was darkness over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, God's Spirit, hovered over planet earth and began to warm the entire planet. And everything that was destroyed suddenly started taking shape again. And then, here's what I want you to see. In Hebrews 1 and 2, the writer speaking of God, and he said, has in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, by whom also he made the worlds by whom he made the worlds. The, the, the word by there is important. God by his son made the worlds. Genesis 1, 2 says, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Jehovah God authorized the building of the earth and Jesus directed the building and the Spirit of God or the Holy Ghost moved and did the work. What does that tell you? It tells you a trinity. I remember when I was being examined for my ordination, I went before the examining board after I had written all the answers on the test and felt that I did real well with that. Then comes the time of real testing when those seasoned men fire the questions to you and they ask me about the Trinity and my response was very simple very naive I said brethren there's nowhere in the Bible that we find the word Trinity and two of the three examiners lit in on me like a duck on a June bug. They started firing at me like I was some agnostic. And then one of the examiners sitting behind a desk with his feet propped up on the desk, just studying the situation, finally spoke up. Now, I gave my defense. I took them to Jesus being baptized. I said, there are plenty of references to the Trinity, but the Word is not there. When Jesus was baptized and He went down into the river, a voice from heaven spoke. One, this is my beloved Son. Two, and the Spirit of God descended upon Him like a dove. I said, that's three, that's a Trinity, but it doesn't say a Trinity. And so here we have in the very creation of the world, God saw that it needed to be created, he authorized it. Jesus directed the building of the earth and the Holy Ghost did the work. Can I tell you that it's the work of the Holy Ghost today 
to do the work of Jesus in hearts and lives. No man comes to the Father except my spirit draws him, the scripture tells us. Jesus, when he went away, he said, I will send you another comforter. I'm telling you that when the spirit of God hovered over this earth, that was the first and the greatest global warming that ever happened. When the Spirit of God hovered and made things right, then day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, creation was made after its kind. We didn't come from monkeys. Furthermore, we didn't come from apes. We were created in the image of God. And again, God said, let us, us make man. And they created man in his own image. What does God look like? What does Jesus look like? The disciples said that he looked like a prophet. A prophet is a man. And if Jesus looks like a prophet, a man, then God looks like a man. I wish I could get some support in here. And Jesus, before he went away, he said, I will send you another comforter. I will not leave you alone. I will send a comforter that will be with you to guide you, to lead you, to be with you, to infill you, to indwell you, and give you guidance through your walk with God. Jesus said, I'll send you another comforter. In fact, he said in Acts 1 and 8, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, when I tell you, I'm very disturbed today. I'm very disturbed today over some things. Things that got into my spirit last night. Generally, the way I prepare for my message on Sunday, I begin early in the week, and the Spirit of the Lord kind of stirs it up within me. And the thoughts come together. And in my head, and in my heart, and in my spirit, I have it. And on Saturday is warm-up day. I'll preach to myself three or four times on Saturday to get ready for here. But yesterday, in warm-up time, I came across some things that messed up my head. And I'm going to share it with you today because this is Pentecost Sunday. Today, while Pentecostals around the world are celebrating the pouring of God's Spirit upon the human race and the Holy Ghost indwelling and filling men and women's hearts and lives with power to do work for God. While we're reading scriptures supporting that and celebrating it, today at the Vatican, the Pope representing the Roman Catholic Church that claims over a billion members globally and the highest official of Islam, which claims over one billion adherents globally. Today, while we're preaching and teaching and rejoicing over Pentecost, these two world religious leaders have gathered together and jointly selected verses from the Quran and verses from the New Testament that would be read today at Vatican, at St. Peter's Square at the Vatican. Now I'm telling you, 
We are living in the last days. When the Pope makes the statement, it is time for Christians and Muslims to begin working together to build peace and togetherness around the world. Now, if that doesn't blow your socks off, let me share something else with you. There is a growing thing called Chrislam. It's a bit blending of Islam and Christianity. Islam is starting to spread in America. This is an article taken from the Orange County Registry in California. I am not going to name a church. I am not going to call a person's name because I know this message is going to be on YouTube before too long. I'm not going to take a slam like that, but I am going to reveal to you what was said. This article was regarding a certain pastor speaking, a well-known pastor of a large church, speaking at the convention of the Islamic Society of North America. His statement was, many Christians have been guilty of sinning against our Muslim neighbors. Before we shake your hand in responding to your letter of invitation for him to speak at that society, before we shake your hand in responding to your letter, we ask forgiveness of the all-merciful one and of the Muslim community around the world. While many supporters of this pastor insist that these claims are false, yet his church leadership confirmed that the article in the register was factually accurate. Folks at that church, and this is a quote, initially made but then withdrew a request for clarification to the story's first paragraph. Quote, instead of the words Muslims and Christians worship the same God, they wanted the story to read Muslims and Christians believe that God is one. The rest of the story, they said, is factually accurate. The pastor in an interview was asked, are you promoting Chrislam? He said, of course not. It's the lie that won't die. Yet his staff has acknowledged that the article in the register is correct, saying he had a role in the King's Way, another document, and he signed a common word, and he even traveled to Syria earlier. The reporter for the Register contacted Dr. Gwen Gibbord, who serves an organization called Christian Muslim Consultative Group. In the interview, she states that her group has avoided inviting evangelical Christians to join their endeavor to, quote, foster relationships between churches and mosques, but is now changing that opinion because the man's church, his, those efforts are unprecedented. End of article. The Son of Man cannot return to this earth until there first be a great falling away. That is as great a falling away as I have ever known. I'm telling you, we are living on the doorstep of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. A few years ago, there was great excitement about there before the Lord returns, there's going to be a great and mighty revival that's going to sweep the world. Scripture says there's going to be a falling away. And that's the opposite of revival. However, I'm here to tell you there are spots and pockets of revival all over the world today in greater magnitude than ever before. 
The Pentecostal flames are war warming this world. Global warming at its best. When the Holy Ghost of heaven comes down and fills men and women with God's spirit and they become empowered to do the work that God called them to do. Jesus gave us an assignment. He gave us a great task. It's called the Great Commission. Now I want you to note three significant points. Our job is to do the work that Christ did not do. We are to continue it. And the only way we can do that is becoming equipped by the power of Almighty God through the Holy Spirit. You see, on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2 and 4, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one mind and in one place and in one accord. And suddenly, God has many suddenlies, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting. And then there appeared unto them before them cloven tongues of fire that sat on each one and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. That was the day of Pentecost. That was the, that was the introduction of the work of the Holy Spirit in mankind on earth after Jesus went back to sit at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for us. So, why do we not see tongues of fire sitting on people today? Because the Holy Spirit was already introduced to this world. The tongues of fire were, were significant in meaning that the Holy Spirit has arrived. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is here to fill every believer. My wife told me, go ahead. My wife told me, not critically, but she told me that I was giving a whole lot of information real fast and it was going to be hard for people to retain. I hope you can retain this because I've got a lot more to give you. <laughs> you see, the disciples had already asked about the kingdom. They had asked about positions. They had asked about leadership. They had asked about authority that Christ had promised. But the point is very critical to note with all diligence. They were to receive power, but not the power of this earth. Not the power of position, not the power of recognition, supervision, uh, fame, not the power of wealth, not the power of politics, but a different kind of power. Their power was spiritual and supernatural. It was to be the very power of God Himself. It was to be the power of the supreme being of the universe. It was to be the power of His presence, the power of His Spirit that would infill us. God's own Spirit would indwell the believer and live in the heart and life of everyone who will invite Him in. Hallelujah. Now, there are those who declare that a person receives the Holy Ghost when they get saved. The Bible does not support that at all. Do you think Jesus would have following him 12 men that didn't believe in him? They were his disciples. And it was to the disciples that he spoke and said, I am going away, but I will send you another comforter. And the angel of heaven looked at them in, as recorded in Acts the first chapter. You men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? You just saw Jesus taken away. Why are you looking up into heaven for this same Jesus? 
shall return in like manner, but go into the city and tarry there until you are endued with power. Jesus gave the promise and the angel gave them the, the instruction to go. Amen. And so they went. And as they were gathered together in one place, one mind, one accord, it's believed that it was the same upper room wherein Jesus met with his disciples for the Last Supper. We have a job. The, the believer's task, secondly, is to witness for God. Let, let me just say right here. The Holy Ghost is not for the manifestations. The initial evidence of the Holy Ghost baptism is speaking in other tongues. You see, Jesus had 12 men following him that were already saved, but they didn't receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost until the day of Pentecost. And in Paul's traveling, when you get over into the 19th chapter, he, he got to one place and he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They were already saved. He asked them, had they received the Holy Ghost since they believed? And their answer to him was, we've not even heard that there was a Holy Ghost. And then he began to preach to them the full gospel. And the Bible says that they were filled with the Holy Ghost as it was with us at the beginning. They received the same empowerment as the disciples received on the day of Pentecost. There are others that proclaim that tongues will cease. And they use the scripture that knowledge shall pass away, tongues shall cease. Well, I want to tell you something. We're living in a world that's smarter than it's ever been before. Knowledge is not faded or passed away, neither have tongues ceased. <laughs> Hallelujah. Our task is to tell people about the kingdom of God. It's not time for us to be clustered together, whether in heaven, whether in the eternal kingdom of God, or in Christian societies. It's not time for us to even be clustered together in the church. Now it is time for all of us, all believers around the world, to be reveling in love and fellowship and the enjoyment and comfort of one another. That's great global warming, hallelujah. The greatest. The point is Christ is making it very critically clear. It's time for witnessing. It's time for being witnesses to and for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Witnessing to Christ is sharing the glorious salvation that we have in Him. It's the great task that every one of us have. It's called the Great Commission. Going throughout all the world. Telling everybody the things that Jesus has said and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Hmm. Now I know in the New Testament we read many times that they were baptized in Jesus' name. Well, the proper way for baptism is not that we baptize in Jesus' name, that literally means in the authority of Jesus Christ. And the proper way to baptize, and I've been preaching all these years, and I've always just gone through it saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's what the scripture said. But you heard what I said this morning. By the authority and command of the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You see, Jesus declared that there were three in heaven that bear witness. Hallelujah. It's understandably clear 
For no greater truth in the universe completely. Man can now live forever. Man can now be delivered from sin. He can be delivered from death. He can be delivered from hell. Just think about it. It's the perfect cure, salvation, that we tell others about. The love of Christ that's in us that we share with others. It's the perfect cure for sin that's secured for them. It's the perfect cure for death. And it's now known that the dead in Christ shall rise first when the Lord comes back. It's the perfect way to escape hell. Hallelujah. It's found in Jesus Christ living within us and then being equipped with the power to work for Him. You see, this Holy Ghost baptism is not about the shouting. It's not about raising our hands. It's not even about talking in tongues. It's about you and your work for God. It's about what you do. Remember what I told you about Lucifer? Did you know that God did not leave humanity without the same type of musical ability as Lucifer did have? I thought that would get your attention. Remember the three instruments? We have them all. We have the wind that's within us. We have the stringed instruments. What do you speak through? Vocal cords. Vocal cords. And we also have percussion instruments within us. You know what they are? Hallelujah. We have all three. And God gave them to us for us to use them to His glory and for His glory to praise the one and only who is worthy of all praise and glory. Hallelujah. We are absolutely, there's no reason in the world, there is no reason in the world for any person to suffer any longer under the weight and bondage of selfishness and hoarding, bitterness and hatred. There's no reason for a person to, to, to suffer under war and power, emptiness or loneliness, fear and anguish. There's, there's no reason for anybody to worry about the inadequate supply and hunger or killing and maiming, insecurity and low self-esteem. Forget about it. You are made in the image of God. Hallelujah. And you are valuable to God. And He has equipped you with all equipment to praise, to witness, to tell, to testify, to God be the glory. We're delivered from guilt and shame. There's no reason for anybody to be bound by those things anymore. And to that I just simply say, God have mercy upon everybody that knows the cure and keeps silent. We are to be witnesses. I told you there are pockets of revival all over the place. There's a great revival happening right now among young people in a church outside of, of uh, Sacramento. They are caught up in the fire and flame of Pentecost. And it's, you know who it is? It's young people. It's young people who are coming together, praying, seeking God. That's why youth camp is so important. That's why youth camp is so valuable to our youth. Because I'm going to tell you, I know preachers that I've prayed with them in the altars of youth camp and saw them filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and later were called to preach the gospel because they received that endowment of power in a youth camp. Amen. There's no greater indictment against 
anybody, any believer, than to know the cure for man's wrongs and keep silent. Amen. Now I want you to note several points. The word you are to be witnesses. That word witness simply means if you have to, become a martyr. Become a martyr if you have to. I read an article sometime back in a Christian publication that I think perfectly exemplifies and demonstrates true love in Christianity. It happened in China. There was a Chinese cook that was thrown into prison because he proclaimed Jesus Christ. And when they threw him into prison, he went into prison with his big fur coat and his hat, and he went in there and was warm and cozy. And then they threw another man in prison who was impoverished and had no cloak for covering. And God spoke to this cook and said, give your coat to the man who has none. And the cook thought within himself. Remember the question I asked you a while ago. He thought within himself, if I give him my coat, I'll surely freeze to death before morning. And then the Lord spoke to his spirit again and said, you keep it for yourself. You keep it for yourself and you'll prove that you're really not mine. He took his coat off and gave it to the impoverished prisoner. Several years later, in a church service, a man stood up and he gave a testimony that he was in prison and he was there in that church. He said, I'm in this church today because one man gave me a coat when I was in prison or I would have died lost, but I'm saved today. Can I tell you, that's witnessing at its very best. Hallelujah. Pockets of revival, it's happening in New Jersey, it's happening in Brazil, it's happening even in the Islamic areas. It's happening in Qatar. It's happening even in Iran. There is a revival of the Holy Ghost outpouring. It's happening in atheistic Europe. Can I tell you that people are receiving the Holy Ghost around the world? To God be the glory. The third thing I would tell you today is not only are we to be a witness, but we have a method by which we witness. Jesus gives us that method, and it is that every believer is to follow this method to spread the gospel. Witness, in the scripture it said, in Jerusalem. That simply means where you live, in your family, at your job, in the marketplace. Sometime back I was walking through the grocery store, and I rounded the corner and started to come up the aisle and I looked and to my amazement there was a person standing in the aisle holding both hands of another shopper carts being left alone you notice I said carts not buggies like we say in South Georgia the carts had just been left there but they were holding hands and I'm telling you this one person was praying the fire of heaven down for that individual and as I went by them I felt the power and presence of Almighty God. You know why? Because somebody had decided I'm going to witness for him right where I am. Hallelujah. Amen. And he also tells us that we are to progressively move outward. Not only right where we live, but move outward into other regions around our area. And then working our way until ultimately we have reached in witness around the world. 
Can I tell you today that since our services have been placed on, being placed on YouTube, we've had people watch these services in, in one in Syria, others in Africa, in Indonesia, one in France, another in the old Soviet Union. The gospel from this church is going around the world. Why? Because we're fulfilling the job that Jesus called us to do, is to witness to everybody. We're to go personally, as far as we can go individually. We're to go sacrificially to reach other people. We are to use every support means available to reach the world. We are to witness where we are first. Seeing that Jesus Christ is lifted up to all men near us, throughout our home area, throughout our neighborhood, into the community where we live, and then go further, ever pressing outward. That's why we have world missions. That's why we have world outreach. That's why we have Operation Compassion. That's why we have Hope Charitable Services, because God has called us to globally tell people that Jesus loves them. And if you do not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost today, if you have not received the Holy Ghost since you believed, as they did at the beginning on the day of Pentecost, I charge you this day to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet, please.